really honored to be invited to participate in this lobby training. So yes, I'm Tamara Staten, and four years ago, last month actually, I helped to get the Portland, Oregon chapter off the ground, and I'm still co-leading it today with Danella Broad. And it's been a beautiful journey watching it grow as it has, and I've learned a ton. And I'm also the regional coordination consultant for the greater Pacific Northwest, which includes the far-reaching states of Alaska and Hawaii, as well as mainland states of Washington, Oregon, and Idaho. And when I'm not CCLing and spending time with our seven-year-old daughter, Kaya, I run a business called Thriving Solar, working with small and medium-sized solar companies on improving team culture and communication. Wow, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you, Tamara. Uh, so that's me on the screen now. My name is Ricky Bradley. I'm one of the CCL IT directors, uh, and also I'm the Dallas, Texas group leader. Well, hi, I'm Jim Probst. I'm the uh, state coordinator for West Virginia, and I've uh, been with CCL about two and a half years now, and when I'm not working on CCL, uh, I'm a furniture maker, have my own furniture making business, and I design my, the work that I do. Awesome. Well, thanks, thanks Jim. Um, and so also joining us tonight for the role play part of our demonstration is uh, Stephanie Doyle. Stephanie, if you would take a moment just to introduce yourself to everyone. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm the Senior Outreach Liaison for CCL, and I'm located in our DC office. Um, I do a lot of work with NGOs and other organizations talking to them about CCL and our policy, and I also do a lot of work with Danny Richter, who's our Legislative and Science Director. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. All right. So let's take a quick look at our lobbying webinar roadmap. Uh, tonight's lesson is the uh, third in a series of four webinars. So we've already uh, uh, held Congress, one, or excuse me, Lobbying 101, where we looked at the basics of Congress. We talked about what it's like to lobby as a citizen, uh, what our most valuable tools are as lobbyists, and how to build relationships with your member of Congress. And then in 201, we talked about all the things you need to do to get prepared for a meeting with your member of Congress, including all the tools uh, that we have available and the research that you can do. We talked about the meeting leader and assigning roles. And we also talked about the importance of practice during that webinar. And tonight, as, as, you've probably know, as you probably know, we're going to talk about the meeting. We're actually going to go through uh, a couple of meeting demonstrations and, like I said, talk about some of the important elements. And then the last webinar that we have will be on handling difficult situations and some advanced lobbying skills. And that'll be next week, and that'll be with Mark, Rick, uh, Mark uh, uh, Reynolds and Danny Richter. I called him Mark Richter. It's pretty good. All right. So, but before we get to a uh, demonstration of uh, what the meetings sound like, Tamara is going to review something really quick that we discussed in Lobbying 201, and that's the role of a meeting leader. Okay. So an analogy that we find useful here is that of a conductor. The CCL team leader is there to manage the meeting, not to dominate the meeting. The leader is not necessarily the one who talks the most, but who empowers everyone to share and participate, especially the constituents. The leader may choose to be in charge of handling the transitions between different parts of a meeting, and they help keep the conversation on track and help wrap things up. The leader will help the team settle on an appropriate supporting ask for the meeting, and make sure that everyone's on the same page with that. And now Jim's going to tell us about the meeting structure. The meeting outline is pretty simple. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. At the beginning of the meeting, you want to thank them for their time, finding out how much time they have, introduce yourselves and show appreciation, state our purpose, and deliver constituent communications, and present our ask. The middle is the heart of the meeting. This includes the discussion, active listening, hearing their concerns, listening for values, finding common ground, overcoming obstacles, and executing your strategy to move them forward. At the end of the meeting, you want to see if they are willing to commit to our ask or present the supporting ask. Ask the, with whom do they work with across the aisle question, or the, what could we do, be doing more of in the district to make it easier for them to support carbon fee and dividend question and confirm the follow-up items? So what we're going to do now is demonstrate an actual meeting. Great. Thanks, Jim. All right, so I'm going to narrate the demonstration. Now, we're going to stop at certain points to debrief what just happened. And for this demonstration, Tamara will play the meeting leader. 
who also happens to be a constituent of Congressman or Congresswoman Doyle. Uh, Jim is on the lobby team with Tamara, and he is also a constituent. And Stephanie will play the role of Congresswoman Doyle. We had a last minute switch. That's why I might say Congressman. I'm sorry. So what we'll do is we'll go through the beginning, the middle, and the end for an initial meeting with a member of Congress. And then we'll demonstrate the middle section again for a follow-up meeting, one where you have like a very specific agenda to cover. So as I said, our meeting is with Congressman Doyle. She's from Kansas's first district, and her energy aide is Joanna Patrick. And that's who we'll meet with in our second meeting. Now, for this first meeting, our agenda is broad, right? It's our, it's our first meeting. We want to do a few things like establish trust, show respect and appreciation, and really sort of just feel each other out. The first meeting is the start of a long-term relationship. We need to look at it that way. It's not a one-time event. I mean, of course, we want to make sure that they understand our policy and we tell them what we're doing in the district to create political will for them. But we need to be prepared to do a lot of listening in the first meeting especially. So that way we'll know how to move forward in future meetings. So here we go. We're going to start at the beginning of the meeting. Well, first of all, Congresswoman Doyle, we want to acknowledge how busy you are and how appreciative we are that you were able to carve out some time for us today. Well, it's great to see you both so engaged in the political process. I know you both came halfway across the country to visit with me, so I'm really glad to meet with you. Thank you, Congresswoman. We know it's a busy day for you, so how much time do you have for this meeting today? Well, I do have a, I have a committee meeting in about 20 minutes, so that means I can give you 15. You'd think they would have, me give, have given me an office somewhere close to where my committee meets, but I'm stuck over here in Rayburn and the committee meets in Longworth. I guess that's just how the government works. <laughs> yeah, you all do a lot of walking in D.C., that's for sure. Well, my name is Tamara Staten, and I'm a constituent of, of yours living in, in Lawrence, Kansas. And I'm here today because as a German and Spanish teacher and a mother of a seven-year-old, I feel passionate and concerned about securing a healthy place for our youth. And my name is Jim Probst, and I'm a constituent as well. I live in Wichita, and I'm a school teacher. I'm here today because I'm worried about the kind of world the kids I teach will grow up in. And I want to do my part to make it as safe as possible for them. Well, Jim, you know I served for 16 years in the Kansas legislature fighting for school children and seniors. I believe government should exercise its powers to look after our most vulnerable citizens. I admire you for devoting your life to educating our kids. I know it must be especially difficult right now for you with this federal government trying to impose its will on our local school districts. Thank you for the kind words, Congresswoman. So, Congresswoman, we'd like to start by telling you how much we admire your work to protect seniors from identity theft scams. I have an older parent, and your work means I have one less thing to worry about as she ages. Well, thank you for recognizing that, Tamara. It's, it's so important to me that all Kansans know that if they work hard, then they'll be able to retire comfortably. That's fantastic. Since we have just a few minutes, Congresswoman, let me briefly tell you why we are here, and then we'd like to hear your thoughts on our policy. Our purpose is to create the political will for a livable world. Back home in Lawrence, we are working to create the political space we know you'll need to support our policy. For the past couple of months, we've gathered letters and postcards from your constituents and endorsements from community leaders in Lawrence. Here's a stack of 120 letters from your constituents and an endorsement of our policy from Lawrence Regional Medical Center. Our ask for you is if you'd introduce legislation that puts a fee on fossil fuels and returns the net revenue to American households. Although seeing how this is our first meeting with you, how about we start with hearing your thoughts on climate and energy policy? Okay, so let's pause uh, the meeting here real quick. This is Ricky. We're going to debrief that uh, beginning section. So notice what we did, a couple things we did there. We started by thanking her for the meeting, asked how much time we had, I did a brief introduction. Tamara did some of that uh, heart uh, of stuff that we're supposed to do, uh, really tell our story. Um, showed appreciation. We delivered our purpose, uh, delivered some letters and postcards and an endorsement. And then we presented our ask. So pretty standard stuff. But, you know, every meeting is different. So adapt to the situation. This is our first meeting. So it makes sense to sort of make sure we're going through all those parts 
of the meeting agenda. But this may be your 10th meeting, so a formal introduction may not seem necessary. So, you know, play by ear. Or maybe even the member says they only have 10 minutes, so you might have to cut some of that out, right? So just adapt and do what feels right for the situation. Uh, make sure you're reading the room, and we'll talk more about this concept of reading the room and adaptive performance a little bit later in the presentation. One thing notice that we did not do here is that uh, we didn't take the bait to go off topic. Congressman Doyle obviously has some strong thoughts on the federal government's role in local education. But Jim uh, uh, thanked her for her kind words and moved the conversation on. We want to stay on topic. We only have 15 minutes. So we want to make sure that we're focused and keep talking about what we're there to talk about. And we'll talk more about how to keep the conversation on track in Lobbying 401. Also note that the ask that Tamara made is direct, clear, and specific. Our primary ask will always be the same. So it's not worth it at this point to test the waters. The worst possible outcome is this, that we leave and they have no idea why we're there. So don't let that happen. Let's make sure we get the primary ask in early and then we'll check to see if they're able to do it at the end of the meeting. Okay, so let's go ahead and resume the meeting now. So we're in the middle section and we're gonna resume with uh, the Congresswoman's response to Tamara's question. Well, I can't say that I hear much about the need to do something about the climate or global warming. I think I know what the general mood is in Kansas. We have a strong wind sector, but the wind industry needs to begin competing on their own without the need for subsidies or tax credits. That's why I supported a gradual elimination of the production tax credit for wind. So when it comes to energy policy, Tamara, you can put me in the all of the above category. Regardless of climate change or this so-called warming, we need American energy independence. We need to stop propping up one industry at the expense of the other. Don't get me wrong, I'm not anti-environment. I mean, I've been portrayed as being anti-environment. But we need to get this economy going, and these regulations are choking small businesses. The people of Kansas sent me here with a clear message. Stop the federal government's overreach. Well, thanks for sharing that. So, so what I'm hearing you say is that both the economy and the environment are important to you, not one or the other. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, sure. I mean, a lot of negative things are said about me because I'm putting jobs first, but this environmental agenda just it isn't good for business. Well, we can certainly appreciate being unfairly labeled. I mean, we're often portrayed as being anti-business, but nothing could be further from the truth. We, like you, want the economy and the environment to flourish. Have you been briefed on our carbon fee and dividend proposal? I know my aide has reviewed it in detail, Jim, but why don't, you, why don't you tell me about it? Okay, so what we're proposing is this. You put a fee on all carbon-based fuels at the source, so that would mean the, the mine, the wellhead, the port of entry, and then you return all the net revenue to American households and equal dividend checks or rebates. And I might also add, actually, um, that there's a border tax proposal, which is part of our proposal, and that essentially protects companies from business from leakage so that there's a fairness so that if China, for example, if they know that we have a carbon fee, then they're going to be motivated to also have their own carbon fees so that they don't have to pay um, one on ours. So how does this sound in comparison to the regulations sought by the administration? Let me be clear, Jim. This clean power plan is going to kill jobs here in Kansas. And for what? We're going to impose additional costs on Americans? And I don't see how these rules will stop global warming. But I do understand one thing. Increasing costs isn't good for business or consumers. When I first became concerned about the climate, I struggled with that as well. Could I tell you what I found out about the dividend aspect of our proposal that put me at ease? Sure. Put me at ease too, please. Knowing your economic background, I think you'll appreciate what we've learned. What's really interesting about our policy is that not only will it reduce emissions faster than the clean power plant, but by returning the net proceeds to households, the dividend will have a stimulative effect on job creation and the economy. Job creation occurs because when people get a dividend check each month, they spend it. You know as well as anyone that 70% of the American economy is tied to consumer spending, and healthcare is a large slice of that. 
So employers like Lawrence Regional and Children's Hospital stand to benefit from people having more money in their pockets to spend. Okay, thanks, Jim. So let's pause the meeting again, and let's recap that middle part. Again, notice what we didn't do here. We didn't try to correct her or take uh, Congressman Doyle to task for her position on climate or any of the other statements. I mean, it's obvious that we see things differently right now. Uh, but in this initial meeting, why start off with something that will put us in the situation where one of us has to be right and the other one has to be wrong? Instead, it makes more sense to listen to her, ask additional questions so we can start to find common ground and build the relationship from there. So that's what Jim and Tamara are trying to do here. They're trying to find con uh, con com yeah, common ground so that we can move forward in a way that works for Congressman Doyle. It's clear that she doesn't hold the same belief we do regarding global warming. You know, you can tell you heard her uh, sort of dismissively with the statement so-called warming. And she's already revealed to us that, uh, you know, how she feels. So what Jim's trying to do at this point then is to find common ground. It's also evident from the responses to Tamara's explanation and Jim's question that Congressman Doyle is fixated on the costs and probably didn't even hear much about the dividend at all. But rather than explicitly drawing attention to her misperception, Jim just adeptly explained how the dividend would benefit local hospitals. So again, notice, you know, he's not putting her into a situation where she's a loser for not listening or understanding, but rather he's trying to help her move forward. So let's demonstrate how to wrap up a meeting before we come back to the middle section of a follow-up meeting. Now the meeting can draw to end in a couple of ways. Either the timekeeper, which is a role we talked about in lobbying 201, notices that there's only five minutes left in the meeting. Or maybe we begin picking up visual or body language clues signaling that the meeting is over. You know, when someone's glancing at their watch or they close their notebook, they push back from the table, you know, all those things that uh, can signal that they're really, uh, they're not listening anymore. When either of these things happen, it's time to close. And your, and your meeting leader will recognize that and will bring the meeting to a close. The, port, and the important thing here is at that point, they're done listening. Don't try to squeeze everything in. There's going to be another meeting. We're going to ask for another meeting with the office, obviously. So just keep all that you have in your back pocket, and we'll go from there. So let's go ahead and resume this uh, first meeting scenario with the end of the meeting, and then we'll come back and do the uh, second meeting. Okay. So, Congresswoman, I see that we're nearing the end of our time with you, so I wanted to ask you if you'd be willing to introduce a bill that puts a fee on carbon and returns the net proceeds to American households. Stephanie. I think it's a novel approach you have, but I do have some reservations. And besides yourselves, this is not a topic that's important to my constituents. Yeah, I, I totally get that. So this is our first meeting, after all, and we promise to go home and continue working on the grassroots support so that when we meet again, you'll have more letters and endorsements for you. Would you be willing to sit down with your staff and review our proposal and get back to us with, it, with exactly what is preventing you from introducing our policy? I can do that. It seems like I got the easier task. If you're going to speak with folks back home, then may I recommend you speak with Mayor Rawlings? Being a former utility CEO, he's someone I listen to regarding energy issues. Absolutely. Thank you for that recommendation. Like we said earlier, we are trying to make it easier for you to support our policy, so we'll make an appointment to see the mayor. I'm going to leave this one-page ask with you, and how would you like for me to follow up with additional materials in the future? You can follow up with Joanna through email. Congresswoman, one last thing before we leave. Would you mind telling us with whom do you enjoy working with on the other side of the aisle? Well, as you know, I'm new, and there are a lot of ill feelings around here. So I really haven't had the opportunity to bond with many of thoughts yet. Hmm. Well, that must be frustrating, I imagine. But is there one that you've gotten to know some, perhaps? Um, Senator Feinstein and I sat next to each other on the plane the other day, and she's not as bad as she seems on TV. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So <clears throat> that's the end of the demonstration for an initial meeting. <laughs> Excuse me. Notice that our supporting ask was pretty simple in this case. Review our proposal and tell us exactly what's preventing us from getting your support. So for those of you who have lobbied in the past, you might have also noticed 
that um, we have uh, added a couple of things. We added the delivery of constituent communications to the agenda. So we're gathering lots more letters these days. We're gathering lots more um, postcards and endorsements. So it's a good time to bring those to the meeting and actually deliver those. All right, so now we're going to demonstrate what it might sound like for a follow-up meeting. And we're going to demonstrate the, another scenario. Hey, the players all remain the same. That's the good thing. Okay, so besides uh, Stephanie, she's going to be playing uh, Congressman Doyle's energy aid this time for our follow-up meeting. So the situation is this is our second meeting, and now we're meeting with energy aid Joanna Patrick. Now remember at the end of the first meeting, Congressman Doyle agreed to not only review our policy in depth with her energy aid, but also let us know what stands in the way of gaining her support. Now a month after our first meeting, we received an email from Joanna, the energy aid, detailing the Congresswoman's objections to carbon fee and dividend. Now in this meeting, Tamara and Jim are meeting with Joanna, uh, the energy aide. So Joanna, in your follow-up email, you mentioned two things are preventing the Congresswoman from supporting carbon fee and dividend. The first is that the fee or tax seems punitive to the energy industry. And the second is that the dividend seems like income redistribu redistribution. Did I get that correct? You're on the money, Tamara. That's great because we took a look at those concerns and I think what we're going to find here is that there's not a lot of daylight between us. So here's what we did. After we received your email, we circled back and took another look at our proposal. And to gain Congressman Doyle's support, we made sure it addressed those points. Would you like to hear what we found? Absolutely. So let's start with the first item. The perception is that the fee is punitive to fossil fuel producers. I don't know if I've ever told you this, but Reagan's former Secretary of State, George Shultz, is on our advisory board. That's impressive. Yeah, we agree. So we consulted with Secretary Schultz on this, and he tells us that all the players in the energy field should have an equal opportunity to win. He goes on to say that all producers of energy, just like any other business, should be accountable for the full costs of the product they provide, and that we need to put the costs of pr production on the balance sheets of the producers. So what you and I believe that businesses should not be able to subsidize their costs of doing business with tax dollars is what our fee is designed to correct. I mean, we agree that all businesses should pay for their costs of doing business, right? In theory, that sounds great, but you know, we can't switch to these low emitting, lower emitting fuels overnight. We don't. We just don't have the infrastructure to make that switch now. Great thing I'm hearing you say, Joanna, is that we agree on this principle of accountability. Yet we need to address what a smooth transition would look like and possibly how our current producers of energy could lead the way. Why don't we address the second point from your email and then if we have time we can talk more about that transition. Sounds perfect, Jim. What's next? Well, you mentioned that Congressman Doyle considered our proposal to be a form of income redistribution. Can you tell me more about that? Well. Obviously, wealthier people are paying more of the carbon fee than poor people, so they come out behind. I'm wondering if this is an issue of fairness to this office. Yeah, we think everyone deserves fair treatment. Well, it matters to me, too, that things be fair. That's why I like it that everyone gets the same dividend instead of some people getting more and some less. Does that seem fair to you? Yeah. But there are still some winners and losers here. Well, you're right. There are. Why do you think that is? Well, I mean, I suppose because some people use more fossil fuels than others, so their costs would go up more than people who use less. I think you're right. We've been trying to figure out a way to make this as simple and fair as possible. We have some data that shows exactly how the people in your district would fare under carbon fee and dividend. Would you like to take a look at that now? Yeah, sure. Okay, so let's stop here again. Uh, first of all, you guys are getting so good at this acting. It's amazing here. So let's, let's go ahead and uh, debrief the middle of this uh, second scenario here. Now, first of all, notice how this meeting is different than, from the first and that we had a specific agenda or points to cover from our previous meeting. And I think it makes a lot of sense to do that quick summary at the beginning and make sure that everyone's on the same page. 
So there was a quick summary. We were prepared to address those concerns in a way that moved things forward. It's obvious that Jim and Tamara have been preparing to address those points. Again, notice what we didn't do here. We didn't get off track. We stuck to the meeting plan even when the aide brought up a new objection. The objection was we can't make a transition overnight. So our agenda for this meeting was to address the issues that Congressman Doyle raised in the email and we came into it ready to address those items. And now the aide brings up a new point. Now you may or may not think that is a good time to address it. We chose not to right now, but you may think it's the right time. I would say this, if you're not well prepared to address the issue, that they raise an additional issue, this, this, at, you know, this one being transitioning off fossil fuels, then we, you will be setting yourself up to be in a situation where, again, one of you have to be right, one of you have to be wrong. So maybe the point raised by the aid becomes the basis for our next meeting. Or maybe you address it when, and you get to the end of this meeting. It's totally up to you. I mean, here's the point. There is no one size fits all for these meetings. You can adapt on the spot or stick with your plan. If you're prepared to address new issues in a way that can move things forward, then go for it. But don't be afraid to say, you know what? That's an important issue you raised, Joanna. I'd like to gather some more information for you. Can we talk about what a transition to clean energy economy would look like with carbon fee and dividend in our next meeting? That, that's, a, that's a great out. Also notice the number of questions asked by Jim and Tamara. What they're trying to do is draw out more information so we can discover where we have common ground and discover those misconceptions. And also notice another thing. Also notice how they asked for permission to proceed. They said, would you like to take a look at that now? Would you like to hear what we found? It's important to make sure that people are ready to hear the information that you're about to give them. All right, so that's the end of our role play. I know it makes a lot of people sad, but let's go ahead and switch gears here and let's talk about some of the other important elements of a meeting. Every year we get better at what we are doing. We try new things and if they work, we add them to our toolbox. So here's some new tools we are breaking in this year. We are delivering constituent communications. We are asking more questions, draw out more information, and to find out what they do and do not understand about our policy. We are listening for values so that we can establish common ground. We are asking for permission to proceed, asking for permission to prepare them to hear what we have to say. Additionally, at the end of a follow-up meeting, we are replacing the question of with whom do they work with across the aisle with what could we be doing more of in the district to make it easier for you to support our policy. Another important meeting element is play. We are in the relationship business. That's one of our strengths. So never underestimate the power of injecting some personality and fun into a meeting with a staffer or a member of Congress. So, for example, say you find out that the staffer grew up on a ranch. So go ahead and ask if he or she knows how to wrangle cattle. Or if your member of Congress went to a rival school, then you could bring it up in a jovial way. Another thing you should do is ask them about pictures or displays on the office. These are things that they're proud of. I remember one meeting that we were in, there was a big, huge canoe. It was the most beautiful office I'd been in. It was blue. The walls were blue. And there's a beautiful canoe on the wall and we started by talking about the camp that I had been to and how I'd been a canoeing instructor and it was a really easy transition into building a relationship. So if this is your first meeting with a staffer then you could ask them to introduce themselves at the beginning of the meeting. That's a really valuable. I see it totally puts the, the staffer at ease I find. And these, these personal playful moments just help build a stronger relationship and the meetings are way more fun I found for everyone. Another extremely important thing to do beforehand is to develop and practice a set of questions. You may run into a situation where you have an unresponsive aid, so having a set of questions will signal to them that you're prepared to listen and to keep listening. Additionally, no matter how many times you've lobbied, there will be situations where you get flustered. Having a couple of prepared questions will help get you back into the conversation. Also, if you're sitting in a meeting trying to think of the next question, you can't possibly be listening to what the person is saying. And good questions, especially if they build off of previous meetings, allows you to clarify any misunderstandings. 
You know what's a great question that we should know the answer to at every office. What is preventing you from supporting this approach? And when you get stuck, ask, can you tell me what your thoughts are about what we just said? Or do you have any questions about what we just covered? Of course, the most important element of our lobby meetings is our primary ask. This year, as it surely sounds familiar to some of you, we are asking Republicans to introduce the in dividend and Democrats to support existing revenue neutral carbon tax bills or to introduce fee and dividend with a Republican co-sponsor. Given the political reality in D.C. today, we only want our bill submitted if it has a Republican on it. Switching, sorry, swing for the fences with the primary ask. Don't negotiate with yourself. Negotiate with them. Don't deliver the supporting ask until the primary ask has been clearly rejected. And if possible, you know exactly why it has been rejected. If you can determine exactly why they rejected your ask, then you can go to work on addressing that. Have a supporting ask ready to go. So what's a supporting ask? Many members of Congress are not yet ready to introduce or support revenue neutral carbon taxes. But getting legislation passed is a complicated process in which lots of smaller things have to happen before we get along. Every member of Congress may be willing to do one of these smaller things. Supporting asks are very specific asks that start to check off those smaller things and thus still build towards our main ask. When crafting a supporting ask, remember to make it as specific and actionable as possible. For example, don't ask them to support the climate. Ask them to talk about the importance of acting on climate on the campaign trail. See the difference? You want asks that you can check on. So the following is a supporting ask that you'd want to use for any Republican. Would you be willing to talk to Representative Ryan or Senator Hatch about holding a hearing with conservative economists talking about the benefits to the economy of a revenue neutral carbon tax? This ask is especially pertinent to members of the Ways and Means Committee in the House and Republican in the House and Republican members of the Finance Committee in the Senate. Representative Ryan and Senator Hatch are the chairmen on those two committees, and these are the two committees that any carbon tax legislation would have to go through. Hearings are an essential step on the pathway to legislation, and inviting respected conservative economists gives members of Congress political cover. The following is an appropriate supporting ask for any Democrat. Are you willing to commit to revenue neutrality and tell a Republican? Many Democrats are committed to using some portion of carbon tax revenues for some other cause. While many of these causes are worthy projects and related to climate change, it is a non-starter for Republicans. Republicans appreciate that we are asking Demo Democrats to do this, so even if the ask doesn't succeed in bringing Democrats closer on revenue neutrality, it succeeds in building this goodwill with Republicans making it more likely they will view us as good partners. That's a really good point, Jim. So the following supporting ask is appropriate for either Democratic or Republican offices. Will you share the household impact study results with your boss and let me know what he thinks? Or will you share the carbon fee and dividend with your boss and let me know what she thinks? Typically you're meeting with a staffer, not a member of Congress. It's come to our attention that in some cases, the aides we are meeting with are not reporting back to their bosses on what we've told them, even if they understand the policy. This ask is geared specifically at holding staffers accountable for sharing the information we bring to them with their bosses. So another important meeting element is being adaptive, or this concept of adaptive performance. And so what does that mean, really? Well, adaptive performance is pretty simple. It's your ability to diverge from a plan. So we go into the meeting with the plan, but we need to realize that we need to be able to adapt and we need to be able to diverge from that plan as well. It's the ability to perceive and understand what is happening in the moment and being able to react to challenges as they happen. 
You're not only listening to the words being said, but also the tone of the voice and the body language as well. So just remember, we'll have done, we'll have done tons of planning and preparation in advance of our lobby meetings, some more than others, but you know, we can't let our plans and preparation go on autopilot. We can practice ahead of time, but you never know what scenarios will play out. That's why we always need to be focused on what is being said in the moment and respond to what we're hearing, not what we expect or think we heard or what we've practiced or want them to say. We really need to be able to uh, respond to what they are saying, what's being said at that moment. So remain flexible and practice good listening. Well, let's talk about common pitfalls, which will lessen your chances of developing a good working relationship with Congress. We can't control what people will say, but we can control our reactions. Part of why we do research before meetings is so you can anticipate all the things people are going to say, so you don't lose it when they say it. <laughs> Other pitfalls to invoke to avoid include interrupting a member of Congress or a staffer, raising or chasing unrelated topics, talking too much, a weak ask, or getting angry. I also think it's extremely important to give plenty of listening space and focus, sorry, give plenty of listening space and focus on the member of Congress and staffer. So CCL's development director, Lene Pettengill, told me this story about a meeting she had with a quiet staffer. Lene says, she appeared to have a question or a concern but wasn't asking it. One of our team members was get, getting ready to give more information. After all, the staffer wasn't saying anything. However, the team leader, practicing awareness, picked up on the subtle body language and asked the staffer if she might have a question about what she'd been shared so far, about what had been shared with so far, and she did. And when we gave her the space to go back and get the clarification she needed about our proposal, then her body language shifted and you could tell she was ready to hear more. I've also had this experience personally over and over. This is me, Tamara, speaking about my own experience. And, um, and as we, especially as we used to focus more in CCL on mastering our laser talks as opposed to listening and asking questions. And I think this is the most difficult aspect of a staff or a member of Congress meeting. We have so much valuable info, information to share. And, <clears throat> and we're so passionate about addressing the climate crisis that it's hard to just sit there and leave any blank space. And, however, we're likely to be much more effective if we share, share only what the staff are most or, and wants to he, most needs and wants to hear. And that way we're meeting with meeting them where they are, not where we think they should be or want them to be. Great. Thanks, Jammer, the Tamara, and Stephanie. And so uh, we've just covered a lot of material. And so we're going to stop here for understanding and take some questions. Uh, as a reminder, you can still submit your questions through the questions pane in your attendee control uh, panel or by raising your hand. And what we'll do is uh, if you raise your hand, I'll let you know uh, ahead of time that I'm going to unmute you so you can get prepared uh, for your, to ask your question. So let's go ahead and start off with a, a question that's in the question pane. Uh, let me pull it up here real quick, and uh, we'll start with that. Uh, one second. Okay. Um, so Tamara, Jim, Stephanie, here's our first question, and it's from uh, Nadine. Uh, she says, well, it's made, made part of a statement as well, but I noticed that, appre that the appreciation was not related to the environment at all. Interesting. I've never thought of that before. It might make it easier to find something to appreciate my member of Congress for. Anybody want to comment on that? Um, this is Tamara. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, I, I found, Nadine, I was surprised by that too last year when we were told that we could thank them. And I think that optimally if there is some common ground in relation to climate or environment work, then great, even if it's you know somewhat unrelated. But I found that even the unrelated stuff, especially if it's something that the, the member of Congress is really proud of, it ends up lighting them up and their whole body language, their whole demeanor changes right at the beginning of, the, of, your, of your meeting. And so you have this like open space to speak into. So sometimes I think it's actually better and kind of catches them off guard in a really good way if we thank them for stuff that they're not really expecting us to thank them for. Yep. Jim and Stephanie, anything you want to add to that? Or? Well, I, I've also found that sometimes you can find uh, things that they've um, sponsored or, or, or done that it, it affected you personally, and uh, I, I, I think that can be very valuable. Great. 
Uh, Peter says, um, he says, you know, these webinars have been extremely useful and eye-opening. Thank you. I'm wondering, as a first-time lobbyist and also as a new group leader, should I attend the lobby training Sunday morning or should I attend the group leader training, which meets at the same time? Um, Peter, I think the answer to that is we'd, we'd rather have you going to the uh, group leader training um, that will be uh, with Ellie and Mark. Uh, next question, uh, Dale asks, uh, what does don't negotiate with yourself mean? Stephanie, you may uh, be able to uh, answer this, you know, being in the office with Danny all the time, but I know what, what he says usually is, um, you know, don't, uh, don't give them anything less than your full ask. You know, don't, um, don't start negotiating with yourself by asking for less than what our primary ask is. Did you have anything you want to add to that, Stephanie? Um. No, I think that's 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 right on. I mean, you you're always the worst they're going to do is say no. I mean, it doesn't ever hurt to ask, and I think it it just gives a better impression if we're you know sticking to our guns. So I agree with that. Great, uh, and I know like when you're in a meeting sometimes, and it's uh, you got a little bit of anxiety, and you you just want to please the person and have them say yes to something. You really, you start. You know, negotiating with yourself, and that's that's just really what that means. It's just to go in with your full ask and, and stick to it. Um, Abaya asks, and um, I think this is open for interpretation, so maybe you guys can give your thoughts on this. You know, when is the best time to offer the constituent letters that the team has brought? Personally, I think you should save those for the end of the meeting because you don't want them sitting there looking at while you're trying to talk. I was actually going to suggest that if you do it in the beginning of the meeting, then it's like them, it shows that we're, um, we're doing our darndest to create a political space that's viable for them to support our proposal and that we are not just speaking for Citizens Climate Lobby, but that we're speaking on behalf of their constituency. Yeah, so I think the answer to that is there's really not an answer. I think uh, one of those things where you want to, uh, you know, know your office. Um, you know, if it's if it's a member of Congress, you know, they usually want to hear stories more so than they want to hear policy. It's usually the aides that want to hear the policy as uh, more so. So maybe it makes more sense to do it at the beginning. Um, someone even brought up a point the other day was um, pick out the best letter and put it on top. And maybe even you draw their attention to it, and you know if it's a short letter, uh, you know have them look at it and read it. Um, that that's a very powerful thing to do as well. But Abai, I think it just depends on, on the meeting. So just be prepared to uh, you know practice situational awareness there. Um, uh, John and Susan asked um, if they bring up a new problem and we say that we'll get back to them. How should we do that? A phone call to the DC person or wait until November? You're waiting can, for, go ahead, Stephanie. Please. I yeah. Um, I would get back to them, you know, as soon as possible. So, if you ask them what their preferred method is, if they want you to call them back or if an email's better, um, the sooner the better. Uh, just because they're going to forget what they asked you, and um, it's better to keep it fresh in their mind. Would be my opinion. I was I just finished listening to um, or participating in a webinar earlier this week on how to have effective communications with um, congressional offices and one of the things that they said which I felt very validated by as one of the practices that we generally do as CCL members and volunteers is that we um, following up with the office through email is one of the things that staffers rated very very high on their um, effectiveness list, so they rated it that when they get an email, a follow-up email from a group, um, it's very, very effective and not very many groups do it. So if we do that, it not only helps us stand out, but it helps us serve as a resource for them. And another piece that they brought up in that webinar is that um, when they go and they were doing these, um, um, they did a bunch of surveys with these members of Congress and with the staffers in order to gather this data. And what they found is that the, the staffers end up having um, a folder in their, in their inbox or in their email uh, platform 
that says important documents. And one of the guys from this webinar who was running this webinar asked if he could look in there, and they showed it to him, and it was a bunch of resources. Like, it would be like the fee and dividend proposal or the Kevin Omal household study impact support. And um, so it's really, really, uh, we, we stand to really serve, um, to serve ourselves well and to serve as a good resource if we can follow up, I would say, within optimally within a week uh, or two weeks, no more. Jim, anything you want to add to that or any experiences that you have with that? I'm sorry, was that me? Yeah. I, I, I just, I agree. I think you should follow up with ASAP. Great. All right. Uh, let's see. Linda asks, um, if we're in Washington and we're lobbying um, someone other than our own representatives, uh, how do we represent ourselves? Um, I'll start off here, and if you guys have anything you want to add, uh, feel free to. Uh, we discussed this, uh, Linda, in a little bit of detail in Lobbying 201, but the important thing to remember here is, although you're not a constituent, and it is true that you know they really, truly only want to meet with constituents. I mean, that's who represents them, and they're really busy people. Uh, but if you take the approach um, that you're, you're there as a policy advisor, that, uh, you know, that lobbyists meet with them all the time, and they're not constituents. Um, and that you have uh, some really important information for them. And in a lot of cases, especially with the household impact study, how our policy is going to impact their district. So that's really important information that they want to know. And that probably doesn't matter if you're a constituent or not. So I, to me, I would just take the position that I'm a policy advisor. Did you guys want to add to that, Tamara, Stephanie, or Jim? Or Oh, that's great advice. That's it? Okay. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Got a question from, let me see if there are any um, hands raised here real quick. Nope. Everyone's just asking questions. Okay. So I'll keep talking. Uh, Craig asked, um, one CCLR I know was nervous as she said to herself, I'm going to say something that's off and ruin the whole meeting. Would you agree with the tip, uh, being nervous is normal and most all meetings go better than we expect. So relax and be yourself. Yes, for sure. Yes. <laughs> I think that if if we can come from a place of um, any anything that anybody says can always be remedied, um, because if we really trust the people that are in the meetings with us, and I, after being in, in D.C. for three, three national um, conferences now, I have found that, you know, essentially every meeting that I'm in, I'm with people who um, really impress me. So um, especially as we get more and more experienced with this, somebody in that meeting, and I'm, I'm thinking even most of the time it's going to be able to be, if nobody else, the meeting leader, is going to be able to um, you know, fix it, so to speak, or make it better, or you know, do something to, to uh, roll over it, or roll with punches, or create a joke from it. And so if we can just let that, if we can lean into that and have faith that even if we F it up, it's, it's going to be okay because somebody's going to step in and help, help us out, um, then we can be ourselves a little bit more. That's what I find. That's what I had to do in my early years. And even now, <laughs> I don't mean to apply that I don't get nervous because I still do. And I just second that. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would agree. Um, even as a staffer, I still get nervous before meetings and I think the thing to remember too is that you're always going to have somebody in your meeting who's done it before and kind of knows what to expect. And like Tamer said, someone's going to be able to roll with it, and you're, you're, it's it's pretty much impossible to mess up a meeting. So I think everyone should be fine. I just wanted to add one more thing that I just thought of as you were talking, Stephanie, and that is in my first year and even in my second year going back, um, I was really really nervous because. What I've come to realize is I'm not an information person. I'm a people person, and what I've found is that I could, if I could lean, if I could lead and lean into my strengths of, of the people part of me, where I can pick up on stuff and I can sense into stuff and I can read body language and that adaptive performance, that really fancy word that you were talking about, Ricky. If I can lean into that, then I, I don't actually have to worry so much about being the person with the data. I can let. I can let the gyms of the world do that or the whoever, you know, I, I can lead with our strengths. So sometimes I find that um, early on, if I didn't really say so much, then I got to actually um, 
have an opportunity to, to discover what my strength is in those meetings. Yeah, awesome. Yep, the power of teams. It's great. Uh, Dean asks, uh, what if we don't have letters or endorsements? Do we talk about outreach efforts? How else can we show activity in their area um, by our group? And I'd say absolutely. I think the point here is that you want to leave them, let, letting them know that we are for them, we are not against them, and that we are doing what we can as our part as citizens to create political will for them in the district. I think that establishes the, the good relationship. So if you've only, if you're a brand new group and you've just had one outreach event, that's great. Tout that. Talk about it. Say, here's what we're doing for you. We went out to this event and we talked to people about how we were going to get you on our side. I mean, I, I, that's, that's my advice. Anybody else want to add to that? I guess not. I guess I added did that really well. All right. That was so, beautiful, Ricky. Okay. Uh, Dale asked, and I'll let you guys grab this one. Have you detected, and Stephanie, maybe this will be right up your alley working there with Danny. Um, have you detected any issue patterns? Uh, you know, which issues come up most amongst members of Congress? Stephanie, you're muted. There you yeah. go. Um, so I I think we went over this in November, and it might be up online, but um, Danny keeps track of the meetings from June um, in our November lobby day, and he, he keeps track of what the top issues are that show up. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but if I remember them right, I think it was it's usually border adjustment, China, jobs, um, and there should be another top one, like the economy, maybe. Um, but we do have those available, and um, so yeah, there's definitely patterns. Absolutely. So, um, and while you were talking, Stephanie, I was trying to um, log in. Yeah. I was going to show everybody where where that is, but um, I'd have to reveal like some passwords and stuff. I can't do that. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, Dale, uh, great point. So, in even in this past month's action sheet, um, there was a link to a set of laser talks. And those laser talks that we put in this month's action sheet were very strategic. I mean, those are the issues that come up most often. So I would say, you know, practice those, internalize those to where you feel very comfortable and you don't, and they, they just feel like you can, you know, say them at will. So you're not having to sort of think about how to say them. Uh, once you do that, I think you'll be fine. Um, but if you go into CCL community, um, you can actually go into the resources page. And on the left-hand side, you'll see a menu option that says uh, reports, studies, and analysis. And uh, so Danny's analysis of our meetings from last year is there. And it's broken out by uh, Republican offices or Democratic offices and what were the top concerns and how often they came up. Um, so it's really en enlightening. Um, what, I'll, what I promise to do, um, Dale, is in the follow-up email that comes out with this uh, webinar, uh, I'll make sure I include the link there so uh, you guys can um, check that out. But I just also want to add, Ricky, um, to that, that um, to remind all of us, and this is myself included, that um, it's not just about an answer to their question, but following up a question with a question can often help us understand even more deeply about what their concern is. And um, even just offering a one-liner from those laser talks can be enough to get them get them sharing more about what their concern is. Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, and then Linda asked, uh, one, one, we'll take one more question and then we'll wrap things up tonight. Linda asked, so, and I think she's talking about the situation where we are, um, uh, we're not constituents and we're in the meeting and we're uh, taking on the role as a, as a policy advisor. And her question is, so we really need to study up in order to convey the correct information as a, as a proposed policy advisor, right? Um, you know, first of all, Linda, again, you're, you're going to be in the meeting with a lot of people. It's not just going to be you. So, you know, you can, you certainly want to be prepared, uh, but you don't want to put all the pressure on yourself. I think it's like what Tamara and, um, and Jim and, and Stephanie were saying, it is so nice. Um, I know I've been in meetings where I felt like I had to be the person that does all the talking and the leading and just to kind of sit back and watch everyone else just take the meeting and just run with it. I mean, it's a, it's a fantastic feeling. And when you're in D.C., you're with a lot of people who've been trained and have been spending a lot of time getting prepared for the meeting. So, it, yes, you, you want to be prepared, but, you know, don't don't sit there and sweat it and think that you're going to screw things up. 
uh, like I said, if you mess something up or you don't have the answer, it's always good just to say, hey, you know what? I don't really have the answer for that right now. How about I can get back to you with that? It, it's that simple. We have a couple of minutes. Do you guys want to add anything else before we uh, sign off for tonight? I just want to thank everybody for being here. And I know that there's a lot of other ways that you guys could spend your time and yeah. a lot of other things you could also do with you know, three days in June, and I'm really excited that you're going. And thank you for putting as much energy into into this effort as you as you are and as you have. 